Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation here on the Tattooed Historian Facebook and YouTube channels. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. And tonight, our title is Connecting Students with STEAM in the Modern World, McMaster Children and Youth University. And joining me tonight are two friends of mine from the great province of Ontario and someplace I need to get back to as soon as possible because I miss my Tims and I need a large regular as soon as possible. Uh, on, the, on the far right, uh, Neil Orford is the owner and president of Defining Moments Canada. Neil is a retired history teacher, a winner of both the Governor General's and Ontario Premier's Award for Teaching History. His Digital Historian Project won the 2015 Government of Canada History Award. He's been featured on CBC's The National, TVO's The Agenda, and in numerous articles across Canada. He's written for major Canadian publications and is a regular presenter at conferences and workshops. He's worked extensively with the Juno Beach Center and has led a summer institute for history teachers in Normandy. Uh, also joining us this evening is Dr. Sandy Raha. Dr. Sandy Raha is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at McMaster University. He's a biochemist who carries out an active research program on how stresses during pregnancy can affect the health of the baby in later life. He's also the director of the McMaster Children and Youth University, which we're going to be talking about extensively tonight, a community engagement initiative that strives to demonstrate that discovery and creativity can be powerful allies in breaking down the barriers between community youth and post-secondary educational institutions. This program and research associated with it have attracted more than $2 million of funding from private donations and community organizations. Based on his mentorship expertise and novelty of the MCYU program, Sandy has been awarded a number of awards such as the Health Sciences Graduate Student Award for Outstanding Graduate Teaching in 2010, the Canadian Institute of Health Research Synops Award in 2013 for his community engagement and mentorship, McMaster University's Top Teaching Award in 2017, the President's Award for Outstanding Contributions to Teaching and Learning, as well as the Ronald G. Calhoun Science Ambassador Award. Gentlemen, those are some amazing introductions. Thank you for being here. Good to be here. <laughs> Great to be here, John. Thank you. Really appreciate your time and being here with us this evening. It's uh, I, I was first introduced to this uh, program uh, by, uh, by Neil, and Neil directed me to Sandy, and that's how I found out about the McMaster uh, Children and Youth University. And since this brand is all about accessibility and opening up new opportunities for uh, especially younger uh, people who are interested in social sciences, uh, the arts and humanities, I'm really excited to have uh, have this conversation tonight because I, all three of us are about accessibility yeah. and the love of learning and uh, trying to get that to a broader audience. So Sandy, I'd love to uh, to start with you uh, and talk to us about uh, the program at the, the Youth University and uh, what it intends to do. Thank you, John, and thanks very much for the invitation. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, let me let me tell you a little bit about what we're uh, trying to carry out. Um, and uh, a lot of it is, um, and you know, we were talking a little bit about uh, before the show about the the process of learning and um, taking kids down that avenue, <clears throat> but doing that in a slightly different way than what the formal education system does. And so we started this program now, you know, this this year it'll be 10 years. So in 2011, uh, we started with the first lectures, and our lec at that time, our lectures were really um, trying to mimic a program that existed in Europe called Kinder Uni. It's basically mm -hmm. German for Children's University. It it started in 2001 in Tübingen, Germany. And you know, some colleagues introduced me to that program. And by 2011, when I looked at that time, there were about 240 such organizations scattered all around the world, but none in Canada. Hmm. And so we decided that you know we would try to emulate that model here. And that's how we started. And that program was really about introducing young kids to post-secondary education. 
we decided to take probably accidentally a, a slightly different tact. You know, all good journeys uh, sort of start out with all good intent, but things happen along the way and, and we adapted. And so over the last 10 years, where we've sort of morphed this whole effort is um, our, we have two taglines. One is question, discover, create. And that's a philosophy that I uh, focus all of our programming around. Uh, really, it's all about the love of learning. The second one is to create, engage, or stimulate in young kids engaged citizenship. So how do we use all of this creativity? And we sort of deploy that with three pieces in our programming. One, we have monthly lectures at the university where families come and they listen to faculty uh, talk about their research in a family-friendly way. Uh, and what that is specifically designed to do is to give the young people the opportunity to question the scholars that are learning and uncovering new frontiers. The second part of our program is to take to, to engage university students and to train them on how to create these kinds of engaging conversations around topics that they're already studying in their university program. So, you know, uh, science, engineering, social sciences. So we try to bring together teams that are multidisciplinary with purpose. And then we try to address common topics, challenges in society. They create interactive workshops and they take those out to the schools. We, we target um, communities where families might not have the resources to come on campus. So we work with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Hamilton. We work with the YMCA. Um, there's, a, there's another organization here in Hamilton called uh, the North Hamilton uh, Community Health Center that we target. Um, and so they all have after school programs. And we take these, we take the university students to those sites and they work with the kids in, you know, exploring various topics. And we can talk about some of those specifics in a bit. The final piece that we, we started actually now a year ago out of necessity due to COVID is the digital platform. And we had to pivot dramatically from a, in person to creating these kinds of interactive digital experiences. And so um, between those three aspects of the, 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 uh, the program, we try to engage kids and get them into conversations with people at the university. Um, and actually, you know, I want to sort of introduce in all of this how defining moments and Neil came to be. And that was really, you know, we were, we were really passionate about the multidisciplinary perspective, bringing into, you know, if you're studying engineering or you're studying science, you really need to look at this from all different perspectives. And I mean, Neil being an award-winning teacher and we've got a few others that are engaged with us, they were doing this organically in their classrooms and they have great expertise. And one of the things we've learned in our program is how community partners, people outside, you know, the post-secondary institutions can really work to form this learning environment for the kids, which, you know, to some extent, it, if you had the resources, you could generate that environment. But we need to do this in a more thoughtful and uniform fashion. And that's really what MCYU is all about is. Uh, not only getting out to the kids, but also bringing the community to the kids. Yeah, that's something that I was really interested in too. And and uh, both of you, I believe, could touch on on this fact is that uh, where I'm from here in the states, we we tend to not have STEAM, we have STEM, mm -hmm. and we separate and kind of uh, alienate each other in many ways. Uh, from an educational system standpoint, when actually we should be working together. And I think that uh, you all are, are much further ahead on, on that than we are here. But this this multidisciplinary approach 
is so much more welcoming, right, for for students across the spectrum and even even professionals across the spectrum, because you could have students doing presentations on this who are interested in something else other than history, but it still involves arts uh, and social sciences. Or you can have panels later on in their lives at conferences that are varied as far as backgrounds, right? Where it's maybe some scientists and some historians or or uh, someone else who's an archivist who's on a panel, but it all leads in the same direction uh, with that. And and I think that that's something we need to think about, I think further in where, where I'm from, is this multidisciplinary approach. We're starting to see it now, but it's really interesting that uh, you've been doing this for a while with youth for, for, for 10 years and, and, and Neil has used it in the classroom uh, with this kind of an approach. And, and I think this is a really good uh, foundational thing to cover during this live stream is that they can work together. <laughs> they don't have to be like all the money's like, I'm guilty of it. I used to say, well, all the money's going to STEM programs are not going to arts and humanities. And then we start to see that divide you all are bringing it together in a different way. And I think that is so um, interesting and just the right approach overall because to go against each other is just wild. But uh, Neil, do you want to touch on this multiple dis not, yeah, multidisciplinary? <laughs> I need more coffee, gents. You need, you uh, need your Tims. You need your Tims. I need my Tims. <laughs> I'm telling you, I need my honey dip here. Yeah. Uh, my, uh, the multiple dis multidisciplinary uh, approach mixed, you know, along with this, these ideas, how have you seen that in the classroom over your years and also with working with uh, people in, in your programming uh, in, I guess you could say in society, because you do a lot with uh, reaching out to those in Canadian society? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. And, and I, I like to, uh, I like to refer to it as uh, de-siloing education or unsiloing education. Um, you know, that the, we operate teachers and I was a teacher for many years. We operate uh, largely in our silos and, uh, you know, history teacher teaches to history, math teaches to math. And there's, there tends to be discrete curricula for those programs. And uh, that starts, you know, somewhere age appropriate around 12, 13 years old. And uh, and then kids move on through that and ultimately are challenged uh, to specialize either in the world of work or in post-secondary education. and um, you know, even the teachers such as myself are not encouraged to walk down to the science wing of the school and have a chat with the science teachers or much less watch what they do. Um, so yeah, it, it's always been a, it's always been a barrier. And um, I think the digital age, particularly starting somewhere around 2005, 2006 uh, with, with a number of platforms uh, uh, developing, it started to break down those walls. Uh, a lot of us, uh, it was the end of my career as a teacher, but a lot of us started to see the, the uh, implications of, of, uh, of siloed education. And, uh, and, and I think STEM was a product of that, John. I think that, um, you know, the initiative for, for science and technology, worthy as it was, mathematics worthy as it was, of course, was done to the, to the discredit of the arts. Uh, and in many cases to the defunding of the, the arts uh, uh, and, and social sciences. Uh, and we certainly saw that at, at, at secondary education. We absolutely saw it at uh, post-secondary education. Um, and it, and it, was a, it was an international phenomenon. I don't, think it, I don't think it was discrete to the United States. We saw it in Canada, a lot of representation of that in Britain. Um, and, and so, you know, towards the end of my career, I, I became convinced uh, that I needed to start to pursue sort of a trans- disciplinary approach. I never called it multidisciplinary, I called it transdisciplinary because I needed to see, I needed to see uh, um, disciplinarianism, if you want to call it that, as, as uh, you know, as an umbrella for education. And so we, th I started talking about transdisciplinary and that's actually a term that, that the Scandinavians use more than, than we do. Uh, we're more interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary, but I like the notion of transdisciplinary because I liked the thought of establishing through threads that that in our curricula, in our work together as collaborative teachers, uh, we could find threads that weave, um, you know, pathways and directions through curricula that can help each of the each of the disciplines themselves. So, by the time I got to the end of my career and I started working more digitally, um, yeah, it just made more sense. Yeah, that that's a 
really good way of putting it. And I can say transdisciplinary better than multidisciplinary, I think, this <laughs> evening. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I'm having so much problem with that. Uh, Sandy, with this, with this idea of this transdisciplinary approach and uh, MCYU, there's a, a great collaborative effort going on now, and it's, uh, it's timely because of what we're going through with the 1918 flu uh, pandemic and the epidemic that occurred then. Uh, I was looking over that earlier, and you can really see that transdisciplinary uh, feel through all of it, because obviously you're studying the history of science or the history of medicine, and that crosses over different paths. Uh, what has that project been like for for those who have been involved with it and, uh, and talking about medical history and all kinds of stuff in the local areas? Yeah, I think that, um, and it's and it's you know interesting. The transdisciplinary concept that Neil raises is something that you know, as researchers, we do uh, sort of almost organically. Every researcher does that, but strangely, we don't teach that to our students. <laughs> and so, what quite often happens is when they get to the post-secondary level, um, they're a they become a bit confused, right? If I tell them to look at the history of a project or the, the history behind certain scientific methodologies, they think of it as something very strange. Um, and uh, what I'm beginning to realize is that has to be done very purposefully and it has to be done early in their training. And uh, one, of, one of the attempts was sort of, you know, Neil, uh, a, a couple of years ago was looking at this 1918 flu pandemic and right before the 2020 uh, corona pandemic and, and, and it was, you know, in retrospect, uh, maybe Neil was a prophet, I don't <laughs> or is a prophet, but, but, but it, it was an amazing experience for not only the post-secondary students that acted as facilitators for that, but what what really impressed me and an, ex an example of what the students created, I think I put in the link for you, that very first link is uh, a link to that product that was developed. And the really exciting thing for me about that project was this is a project that um, the kids in grades five and six post-secondary students, plus community members, a, 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 a colleague of ours from the Dundas Museum and Archives. There was a, um, uh, a, another gentleman um, in the community. He was, a, he was the Dundas community historian and they came together to, to, to contribute to pieces of this. Um, MCYU facilitated putting the project together and, and you know, uh, we sort of had an arm uh, in, in conducting this project, but um, the great thing here is the teacher in the classroom, Mr. Rob Bell, he was a, a central part of carrying out this project. So here's a project um, that the post-secondary students probably learned as much as the young kids that helped uh, carry out the project. and and and. For me, from, an, from a strictly an academic perspective, you don't get this kind of learning in any other format. I've, I was never taught like that. I don't teach purposefully like that in the courses that I teach at university. But you know, we were allowed, because of the freedom of the program, to sort of exhibit that kind of learning ex in, environment. Um, and I think this is an example of, and even within the context of that team, the, 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 the post-secondary students that created that project, we had somebody from social sciences, we had an engineer on that team, we had a couple of people from health sciences, and they worked together to teach different aspects to the kids. Um, and then we let the kids loose. To, we, we asked them to create things, right? And they came up with wonderful um ideas i i remember uh asking the kids you know if you had to create a create a uh some sort of a tool or some sort of a process where you could prevent people from getting the flu 
right? So we had uh, we had some very practical creations, like a manual about proper hygiene. <laughs> then we had a group of cr kids create a airport metal detector type scanner that would incinerate you if you had the flu. <laughs> so, so you know, the ideas that came forth were, were really, really creative, and I think that's what we're looking at. We getting kids to think outside the bubble. And that's what I see is the transdisciplinary effect of the mentorship. I think that's something too that uh, is very important for those of us who have worked in our separate fields for a while to also consider is that there's times where you gotta get outside of your comfort zone and, and see where you can have uh, the most attention on a project or a theory, thought, that kind of thing, allowing for the accessibility of said thought mm -hmm. and theory, which is uh, one, of, one of the reasons why, uh, one of the many reasons why I wanted to have both of you on at the same time this evening was because both projects with whether it's the uh, MCYU or uh, Defining Moments Canada is about accessibility. It's about having it out there for uh, either children to partake in it for free, you know, and be a part of it and, and to think in different ways, or it's, it's uh, DMC putting out some great information on uh, moments in Canadian history or just the, the act of doing history in new and exciting ways that it's accessible for the masses. Um, I think that's one of the main reasons why all three of us click <laughs> about this because too often we put up those barriers and, and you know, MCYU is made for tearing down that barrier and and so is dmc and and neil i would love for you to, to touch on uh how you see that working for defining moments canada and this relationship alongside mcyu well there's a lot of i appreciate that john and i think we do yeah. you know I, I agree with the notion of us all uh, uh clicking because i i think there's been a confluence of a lot of factors coming to bear in the last 10 to 15 years that um we might have avoided had there not have been uh, this the world of the digital platform. Um, I used to say that you know anything I could teach in the classroom uh, in twenty five to thirty minutes, the kids would be able to find on their phones in in fifteen seconds faster than I could get it out of my mouth. Um, and and you know I think that confronted us uh, with a with a very stark reality in education uh, um, that that needed to be addressed. Uh, that rather than uh, uh, rejecting or pushing off the, the implications of what digital learning presented, uh, embrace it. And let's find ways of developing pedagogy and teaching that, the, you know, that are, are actually uh, cognizant of the power of this instrument and the kinds of learning that we can do. Um, and, and, and organizations like MCYU, I think, I, I think have that ingrained in their, in, in their DNA anyways. Um, that that it really is all about the teaching, and that's where I came to it from. You know, that's the the point that I came to it with is that it's all about the teaching. It has to start there. Um, so, how, so how does a history teacher, in in Sandy's case, how does a science uh, uh, a lecturer, how do we engage kids uh, in a conversation around digital learning um, that recognizes first of all where they are and the sort of evolutionary pathway pathway that all of us are on and i'm kind of i'm an old crocodile like it it it, it has taken a a lot of time and a lot you know probably a lot of energy to uh come to grips with the need to evolve and change and that's where defining moments was born out of was a recognition that we needed to teach differently we needed to approach uh young people uh, with different questions and with different ideas and with different models. And somewhere in there, we also needed to build enough space for our teachers to catch up. Uh, and, and, and that if we figured that we built that space in for teachers to catch up, we were also giving a lot of space for the general public to catch up too. Um, so one of the fundamental questions we started with was, can we tell um, defining moments in this case in Canadian history, but I would argue it's in, in every uh, national history. Um, can we tell defining moments um, in in microcosmic ways, in micro historical ways? Can we get big history told through small windows uh, and quiet stories? And we felt we could, uh, but it it was not a pedagogy that currently existed, so we had to create it. 
Yeah, some people have asked me, where did you learn how to make certain things online, like on the platforms? Where'd you learn to do podcasts? Where'd you learn to do this? And I keep telling them, you know, I earned an associate's degree in accounting. I earned a master's degree in history and everything else is the University of Google. Yeah. And I had to, and I had to Google everything and watch hours of YouTube videos to come up with stuff because we're all trained traditionally. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I can say that because I, I was I didn't I earned my grad degree in 2013. We were still not up to power with being a historian on social media. Uh, so we all have to learn a different way to teach a different in a different manner. And uh, that's all for me personally, that's hours and hours of Google and that's hours and hours of YouTube. And how do you do this and how do you do that? So it's all a, a, a giant learning process for figuring out what, where is this demographic at and how do I reach that demographic? Yeah. So one, and, and Sandy talks about this a lot. I'm not going to steal your thunder, Sandy, but Sandy talks about this a lot. Like, um, you know, one of the, one of the pursuits are uh, in science and one of the conceits maybe. So sorry for using that word, Sandy, is that, um, you, you know, in the sciences, you can't fail. There's this, there's this prevailing narrative that, that we can't allow for failure. And, um, and I think, it, you know, that, that has implications also in, uh, in history and heritage and commemoration, you can't fail. And one of the one of the things that both Sandy and I have talked about repeatedly is needing to build the space in the curriculum and needing to build the space in the classroom where kids can experiment and try things and 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 uh, and fail and and you know but fail with support. I mean, it's not it's not failed to denigrate. It's it's failed to 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 be a learning experience. And all of us, uh, you know, all of us at one point in our lives have become better because of the failure we've experienced. Um, and I heck, I do it every time I try to fix my car. <laughs> um, you know, you just, <laughs> okay, I think I need a mechanic. Yeah. Um, and, and, and teachers and, and, you know, and researchers and clinicians and people at the, at the post, at the post-secondary level, I think are conditioned to, to rail against, uh, the embrace of failure. And yet we all know that our greatest scientists failed repeatedly as they, as they, uh, as they experimented and tried to come up with new learning. So what is the problem with giving the kids enough space to experiment and learn and, and try mm -hmm. things? Mm -hmm. And certainly from my point of view, I just spent a lot of time listening to the students uh, tell me, you know, try this, you know, have a look at this. Go home tonight, sir, and have a look at this. Right. And because uh, we're doing it all. So, you know, you should go home and have a look at this. Well, okay, I'll go home and have a look at this. And by and large, uh, um, you know, there are a few things I shouldn't have looked at, but by and large, uh, uh, they had some really good insights. So why not listen to them? Yeah, yeah. I was I was of the opinion that where I, where I heard historians say, "Well, that's stupid. Why would you be there?" I went there, and I was like, "Oh, no one's on TikTok. Okay, I'll go there." You know, it was one of those things where it's like, okay, if everyone else, is, if the younger generations are there, and the the more conservative, and I don't mean that politically, the conservative traditional historians, in my case don't want to be there because they don't understand it, then I need to be there. Yeah. And, uh, and Sandy, I'd love for you to touch on that. And then I have a great question from the audience. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I think that, uh, you know, in science and what Neil and I talk about a lot is that what I see, because, you know, I, I, I mentor masters and PhD students who are on their career path to becoming professionals, but this fear of failure almost um, brings them to indecision at time because, um, and that's where the problem arises, right? Like, I mean, in, in, you know, as they're coming through school, we teach them right and wrong. And if it's wrong, you know, you're going to be penalized heavily. And so they're really afraid to fail. And so we've sort of built that fear into them. And um, when it comes to practical execution in the real world, um, you, you, there's a certain element of risk. Entrepreneurs know that inherently. They Good entrepreneurs take risks. Well, guess what? Good scientists, good historians, I think anybody that's proficient in their profession have has done something that's led to non-optimal outcomes, right? And so I think that's, that's the lesson that we really need to, to get down to the kids. Yeah, there's, I've heard... For every yes for a collaborative effort, I've heard 15 no's. Yes. And it's just letting it slide off your back, move on to the next and go down the list and, uh, you know, figure out who's next and, and figure out who you want to ask 
next or whatever it may be. And, and my first podcasts, they were terrible. So some people would see that as a failure and they would stop. You got to keep going. And yeah, I totally understand all that. Uh, Jen has a great point here. Failure produces experiential data. When one course of action doesn't work, it can often illuminate the pathway forward to what, what does. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's huge. Yeah. But I have a great question here from Paul Lawson. I, I'd love to hear some feedback on this. Uh, is there an organization where Canadian and American share youth STEAM program best practices to avoid reinventing the wheel? <laughs> that's, that's a fantastic question, Paul. That's yeah. a segue into something Neil and I have been talking about. All so, right. <laughs> so this has this has really been and, and it's been very interesting because you know as I said to you at the top of the show, I come out of a of a of a an academic sort of biomedical research environment and we have these, you know, we have national organizations, we have conferences to consolidate data. Uh, we have such organizations for teaching, but one of the things that, that I discovered was um, when I started this program in Europe, they had put together this European uh, Children's University Network to sort of bring together like-minded people who were going to curate and um, share uh, this kind of experience so it doesn't uh, end up, as, uh, as was said, creating the, recreating the wheel. And so over the last couple of years, we've been trying to sort of gather funding, gather momentum um, to build, uh, you know, we're going to call it the Canadian Children's University Network. And, and you know, Neil is going to be a central part of that. And the goal is not to monopolize the education process, but basically to, to create an organization where we can share these experiences and pass on um, what we've learned onto other organizations. Um, and one of the biggest things that we've learned over the, the last 10 years is like, like you said, uh, John, uh, a few minutes earlier about the, you know, there being uh, a number of failures before the success comes, um, is that when we, when we sort of started out and we asked people to share their experiences, we got shut down repeatedly. People were very suspicious. Why should we share with you? We're doing this and this is our unique piece. And that sort of comes out of an academic background. And, and um, I think uh, where we want to go with this is quite the opposite. Neil has been so... Uh, collaborative, and we've now met a number of other people that are collaborative. And so we want to create momentum, create an organization that will really get, engage different organizations in bringing together partners within each community, local communities, to create this learning bubble for the kids. Uh, and I think that's sort of what we're, we're headed with that. We don't know of any central organization, at least in Canada, that, that does this. And so that's why um, Neil and I, and, and in the States, there might be state dependent organizations, but I'm not aware of a federal um, organization in the United States that, that sort of facilitates this. I don't know, Neil, if you are. No, there isn't. I mean, uh, uh, there's been a lot of movement on the part of the uh, National Association of Public Historians and uh, National Endowment of the Arts in the United States uh, towards more STEAM uh, enterprise. And certainly, um, I mean, one of the challenges Canadians have, of course, is that everything, all education is run provincially. And and when I use the word provincial, I don't just mean as a, as a statutory uh, 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 framework. It's also very provincial uh, in a lot of cases. And so uh, you know, we don't have we don't have kind of that 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 national that national vision for what teaching in Canada should look like. Um, there are movements there uh, towards it, but it, it is absolutely in its infancy. And of course, you know, one of the things that, that Sandy and I have spent a lot of time talking about is that it requires new pedagogy, it requires a new frame of thinking, and it requires new models for for education. Uh, and we're we're really just at the infancy of that now. And COVID, you know, uh, there are there are very few blessings that we can attribute to COVID. One of the blessings, though, is that uh, a, a global pandemic strips away and exposes all the frailties and all the 
all the flaws that that we've all sort of intuitively understood uh, for a long time. It's uh, it's stripped all that away. It's exposed our frailties. Um, one of them is in education, and it's time now to 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 consider the the what what COVID has shown us about the need to come back to a post pandemic world and do things differently. That's a great segue into what I just thought of about five minutes ago. What <laughs> how <laughs> we're all on the we're all on the same page here. Yeah. Uh, how how has this experience opened our eyes to what we can do? In our in this kind of a situation where we can do these transdisciplinary approaches and be able to move forward post COVID, whether that's the end of 2021, beginning of 2022, uh, that doesn't matter. But what have we learned from this that we can then say, well, if we can do this, we can do that, or we can do this a different way. Is there something with uh, MCYU uh, that you see differently, Sandy? As far as maybe not differently, but you see different potential that can be done with it uh, because of the human experience of living through this pandemic and, and how we've had to change digitally? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I've talked with Neil about this, is that <clears throat> prior to COVID, um, we were primarily face-to-face. -face. Like, we wanted to do in-person, and we really, and we still strongly believe in that. But the force to go digital and virtual has really brought to the surface the power of that technology and how you know we don't need to rely totally on digital we don't need to rely totally on face to face and we've started to develop these blended um, approaches um, to to engagement um, you know a lot of a lot of engaged education focuses on gamification of education but it doesn't all need to be that way. And so we, you know, we've been talking to Neil, we've been working on some approaches ourselves on how we can potentially create engagements, um, different formats, different digital ways in which kids could share their learning, right? And get become um, proficient at uh, communicating through various means. And you said it yourself, you, you were self-taught from the, University of Google. And guess what? The kids are fantastic at that. And so these are opportunities that we can present to the to the kids. And, and you know, they respond with flying colors. And I think that's one of the 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 moving forward directions. Um, but one of the other pieces we do at MCYU is we started to do a bunch of research. And one of the one of the perspectives on um, the research perspectives that we've start, we've launched, and we just launched it this past Monday, uh, was really serving the community to ask um, how COVID has affected their learning experience, uh, especially through the digital pieces. And we were a little bit worried, you know, people are exhausted, people are not going to respond. But I was sharing with Neil uh, in one day. We had over 400 parents and families respond to that survey. So now we've got a rich uh, database that, you know, hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to mine that and figure out what some of the significant barriers were. And we, we, can, we can work with the Board of Education locally to try to address those pieces. And that's, you know, again, like Neil says, there, there hasn't been very much in the way of blessings, but it is really important that we identify the pieces that uh, the things that we're learning out of this experience and help to ensure that those things, you know, we're going to be coming across societal crises in the future. That's a no brainer. We know that. Right. And so um, we, we, we need to start making efforts to bring some of those barriers down now. Yeah, Neil, we're we're living through <clears throat> multiple defining moments, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not only Canada, but us as well and every other nation on earth and all in our different little ways. Uh, DMC was built, uh, uh, you know, on this digital backbone, you know, right, of having accessibility and, and being digital. Is there something with DMC that you see uh, changing slightly or trying something new? when we can go back to a sense of normalcy or is it going to be 
business as usual because it's worked out great so far and and dmc has grown and uh you don't want to you don't want to uh you know fix something that's not broke so yeah. <laughs> is there something that you may have taken away from this like you say during this pandemic well i i don't um you know, you know, I don't think that we're going to come back in September or whenever we come back to the classroom mm -hmm. um, uh, and do traditional education the way we did before. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's I think it is going to be some kind of hybrid experience between synchronous or online remote learning and and traditional classroom teaching. But I actually think that the teachers are going to approach are going to approach how they teach differently. And as I said, one of the things that we've sort of caught on to through the pandemic is that we need a new line of thinking. We need a new line of, of, of uh, uh, a new model for how we approach uh, uh, digital as well as hybrid learning. Uh, and we, we, you know, I think, I think what we're experimenting right, right now with uh, DMC is, uh, is one model. Uh, and what we're attempting to offer to everybody is, 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 is one possible solution. I think there's multiple solutions. Well, we're very happy with the one that we have right now for everybody. It's called curatorial thinking, and it um, and it's a it's a line of inquiry that uh, that we're we're building out constantly and starting with Sandy and others to do some research around. Um, but our our approach essentially is that in the infodemic that that kids uh, face every day when they're on this uh, laptop or when they're on this device. Um, they're confronted with uh, a tsunami of information, uh, um, so much of which is irrelevant and pointless, and some of which is downright misleading and, and, and evil and contrived. Uh, so how do you as a young person uh, curate your learning? How do you as a young person uh, uh, establish uh, what it is that you need to do if you're sitting at home in your basement, if you don't have the kind of vigilance uh, uh, from mom and dad helping out? Um, how is it that you 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 curate your own learning? So we have to give them the tools to be able to do that. And I think we're trying. I think we've got uh, a good model at uh, Defining Moments Canada. But there's no question that um, you know that that is that has become abundantly clear to us uh, over the last 18 months. Yeah, yeah, and that's one of the things that we really focus on, and that's where sort of Neil and I really connected initially was you know. As you said, with the STEM programs, it's about how to do something. With the STEAM programs, what we're really focused on is the critical thinking, um, the interpretation, using histor historical um, anecdotes to try to demonstrate to kids that the importance of looking back to predict the future is, is really critical. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, science hasn't traditionally been taught in that way. And, and you know, more because I'm a, I'm a, my field is in the area of science, so I sort of tend to focus on that. But, uh, but uh, you could say the same for all other disciplines, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one thing that um, I encountered too was that I would tell people, well, this is how I do history. And they'd be like, well, you can't do history. You can only teach it or learn it. And it's like, but you can do it there. You, you can be some, you can do history a certain way. You can be a certain way with it. And I think that's something else that um, we have to, to cross too in a transdisciplinary sense, because when we think of science, Sandy, we think of doing experiments yeah. and, and, and coming out with a conclusion with that. We don't think about, uh, in some cases, we don't think about history the same way because in, in, in school, you do math problems, you do science projects and all this, but you just learn history. And uh, you know, we're, we're kind of coming around to that thought process where it's like, well, you can actually do history. Yeah. And as a pattern, how do you do history? Um, it's almost getting to that point now where we're thinking of it almost in a transdisciplinary sense of, you can do history just as you do science. Yeah, yeah and I think it's, the, you know, it gets misportrayed in, in popular culture and TV, right? With Especially with science where, you know, you see in CSI Miami, they, they walk into the lab and all the solutions appear before them. But, you know, even on medical shows, it, it sort of, you know, solutions come to them. <laughs> but uh, what's not told is there's a, there's a lot of learning and a lot of... Uh, failures essentially behind yeah. each each advancement that happens in science and and that piece isn't taught and i think that's where the historical perspectives really come into uh disciplines like science mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
So what are you looking forward to with uh, MCYU when we are out of this predicament that we are in? What's the one thing that you miss or that you're looking forward to building when this is all done? I think uh, I think the first thing is I want to see some real people. <laughs> I think <laughs> I true. really miss the engagement of the kids, um, mm -hmm. uh, the face-to-face -face engagement, the enthusiasm that you can palpably sense in a room. Um, uh, I think that's you know the one sort of immediate thing. But I will tell you, like as M Neil says, you know the the digital piece. There's you have to. You have to really harvest what's been learned from from engaging digitally over all these last years. And one of the things that we've been noticing as we've been doing these lectures, our, our MCYU monthly lectures when they come online, is normally, you know, kids sit with their families, but online they actually converse with each other, which you know doesn't normally happen in a in a, in a classroom setting. Mm -hmm. um, I think. I, I really want to uh, sort of revisit that as soon as this thing is over. But I think I'm really looking forward to more working with Neil and building this sort of national uh, partnership where we can share uh, some of what we've learned. And you know, one of the biggest things is me being in a post-secondary institution, post-secondary institutions don't really reach out to teach to little kids, right? And that that's not a very conventional paradigm. Um, and so we've really been, you know, they, they reach out to young people more in terms of here's an activity, let's do the activity so that you get the experience. Worse going out, you know, saying that here's a problem, let's solve it together. And that's really what I look forward to in advancing that pedagogy and collaboration with Neil and a, and a number of others. Mm -hmm. Neil, how about you? Well, after uh, after Sandy and I get together for uh, for fish and chips and and Guinness and mushy peas uh, <laughs> down in down in Hamilton, um, all the world will be set right. But uh, uh, <laughs> no, I, I I think um, I think Sandy's right. I think I think no question. It's it's engaging with kids again. Um, for our purposes, I mean, as as a business. Uh, we have several commemorative projects that are we, we've got contracts with the federal government to deliver. And um, as a heritage education organization, uh, it's time for us to, you know, to actually get back into the game of doing doing commemorations, whether they be physical commemorations or or digital platform com uh, or virtual uh, commemorations. And, um, you know, and to really carry off good uh, commemorate historical commemorations, especially in a country the size of Canada, trying to establish a national a national commemoration. You've got to be in the communities, and you've got to. I've got to get to Wetasco in Alberta, and I've got to get to Moncton, New Brunswick, and and Trois Rivières, Quebec. You know, we've got to get to those places, and that's how we find the history. That's how we find the fantastic citizen historians that we deal with, and uh, and how we learn the stories in those communities. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. I'm looking forward to being able to join you in Ontario yeah. uh, so I can cover some Canadian history and uh, and help out uh, in any way I can. Uh, Sandy, before we do sign off, uh, I do want to ask, is there any way that anyone can help volunteer for MCYU in any capacity moving forward, uh, yeah. whether it's during the pandemic or after? Yeah. So... If you go to our website, there's an email address and you're more than, if you want information, if you want, I mean, Neil and I love friends. We'll just, you know, <laughs> like we said, we love to chat about the, the, uh, the, the, the challenges that are involved in developing something like this. And much like our conversation, you, you never know what people are going to bring to the table and the, the perspectives they're going to bring. So, mm -hmm. Anybody that wants to reach out and chat, volunteer, uh, uh, reach out and contact us through the uh, email address on the website. It's it's available. Um, and I think you did. I saw you put the, um, the the website address on the on the screen as well. Yes. Um, and then um, I just wanted to throw in. I mean, I, I think you uh, shared the link for the little project we did, the, the curatorial thinking project around the 1918 flu pandemic. The second yes. link, the YouTube link, is really the kids' opinions of that project. So 
if people want to visit that to get a flavor of what the kids think, it's it's amazing. It really is. That's fantastic. And Neil, how about Defying Moments Canada? Uh, I put the address in the uh, chat and on the screen. Uh, how can uh, people support your project? Yeah, again, uh, we've got an intake uh, email, info at canhis.ca. Um, and, uh, and we're, you know, we, we get... We get emails every day from Canadians who've got really incredible stories to tell us about our projects. Uh, and, and that level of communitarian uh, uh, involvement in our projects is so important. We couldn't have done the Spanish flu commemoration if we hadn't have known the, the micro histories that went on across the country. And we found, I mean, we just found riveting stories uh, 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 that, that, that we like to say that we uncovered. Um, and we know that in the current project that we're doing on the 100th anniversary of insulin, uh, we've got uh, diabetic history out there across the country that we're trying to we're trying to gather. So, people that have stories to tell, stories to share, connections to make, please get in touch with us. Uh, we really, really want that. Yes, I know that my friend Grant Maltman at Banting House is having a great time with this, even though you were going through a pandemic. It's like the, the worst timing to have a hundredth anniversary when That's we right. can't be together and, and do <laughs> stuff, but. Doing his best, and I think he's going to be on uh, MCYU, yeah. correct, Sandy? Yeah, next month, uh, on I believe it's the 24th of May, uh, he's going to be, uh, sorry, I lied, 22nd of May, he's going to be uh, on uh, MCYU providing a, uh, not only a historical perspective, but a, a, um, a discussion about Frederick Banting, the man. And, and so uh, it'll be very, very interesting talking with him. Awesome. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me this evening. This has been fantastic. And I'm so glad that we could highlight both of your entities. But, uh, you know, Sandy, we, we definitely wanted to give a major shout out to MCYU tonight uh, because yeah. they've, you're doing great stuff there for the kids and it's free. And I love the accessibility. And uh, when Neil brought this up to me, I said, we got to we got to do this and uh, get you Give you some Americans to see what's going on up there, but also some of my Canadian friends who are hanging out in the yeah. in the chat as well. So thank you so much for for being on. I really thank you, John. The opportunity. Thank you so yeah. much, John. And thank great you. to see you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, everybody in the chat on Facebook and YouTube. This is going to be a permanent fixture here on Facebook and YouTube, so you can come back and watch it whenever you like. But uh, please be safe out there. Keep masked. Get that inoculation so we can get the border open so I can go see Neil and have some, some <laughs> fish and chips. And I can stop around and see Sandy as well and, and volunteer my time. But thank Ooh. you, everyone, for, for being with us this evening. Take please care. take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.